Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Tim Stenevec on Bloomberg Radio. Well, just today, the Wall Street Journal reported that Rod Stewart has sold his song catalog, as well as some of his name and likeness rights, to iconic artist group for nearly $100 million. Rod Stewart joins other artists, from Bob Dylan to Bruce Springs, Nina John Legend to Stevie Nicks, Neil Young, and more, we've talked about this a lot, who've cashed in by selling their catalogs. We have back with us Sharice clark Soros, founder and CEO of Harborview Equity Partners, she was previously a managing director at Morgan Stanley, and in addition to many other positions she holds right now, is a trustee at Carnegie Hall. You'll remember that she joined us back in October from our Screen Time event in Hollywood. Sharice, how are you? I'm great, thank you. Thank you so much for having me again. It's yeah, great it's, to be back with you. Yeah, hey, we love it when you join us, and especially on a day like today. I mean, you couldn't ask for better uh, a news peg than the Rod Stewart news uh, earlier today. Um, did this surprise you at all? No, listen, I mean, you know, Rod is an iconic artist and one that, you know, is deserving of value and and the value creation that he's created over the generations of music. So, no, it doesn't surprise me at all. There's a number of different artists, as you've mentioned so um, eloquently in your preamble, that have chosen to look at creating liquidity for themselves to create ultimately agency. Um, Sometimes it's estate planning for older artists. Sometimes for younger artists, it's agency with respect to how they engage in the business overall. So it doesn't surprise me at all. The music market has been active and some of the, you know, legacy iconic names get all the headlines. Some artists, even artists that we work with, never announce at all and never want to be announced publicly at all because of how they engage in their personal business. But um, no, it doesn't surprise me, but it is so well deserved, you know, as a kid of the 80s, who doesn't love Rod Stewart? Well, the the reason why I asked if it surprised you is because the my understanding is this this market has been a little soft in, in recent months. So is that not the case? Listen, I mean, I think it depends on your perspective. Our point of view has been, has always been that we are, you know, longstanding stalwarts of the business. And so I think people who are, you know, opportunistic tourists who, you know, are playing, you know, relative value versus vis-a-vis rates, they may be in and out of markets, which may feel like it's soft. We have, you know, been very focused on this market. So we've been really active, you know, throughout the entirety of 2023. We've had a robust and very busy first quarter. Um, and we continue to see a lot of activity in front of us. You know, the way that the market ha- transacts has changed a little bit, obviously, with the rise in rates over the last 18 months or so. Um, but I think the resiliency of the asset class, the I love music of it all, right, that we all are listening to music and engaging in music in all these various ways in our lives, whether passively or actively, has led to a resiliency that is counter cyclical to everything else that we see is truly non correlated. So there is a change in terms of cost of capital, the, the cost of value and the value of money has changed for every risk asset class. There is no risk asset class that's not correlated to the cost of money. Mm-hmm. But from a resiliency perspective, you've seen that resiliency continue to play through. Sharice, hey, Shanali Basic here. Good to talk to you today. Uh, you know, over the last couple of years, you've brought catalogs tied to some really iconic names, Incubus, Brad Paisley, Wiz Khalifa. Uh, if you think about how this asset class has grown. You were really a pioneer in this world. How did the business of buying music rights become a mainstream financial asset? Yeah. Well, I think it's two things. One, I think the science experiment is over. You know, one of my colleagues on a panel that we did earlier this month kind of really labeled it that I think that is true. We are sort of still in the early innings. So still, you know, capital that is is still a capital constrained environment with respect to this asset class, which makes it you know, continues to be attractive for us. But I think the way that it became really investable and scalable is twofold. One is that obviously, you know, we're living in a world where technology is the way that we consume and that technology produces rich, very rich data. And that rich data allows for cash flows associated with that to then be understood, evaluated, and then invested in. Um, So that's number one. I think the second is you know, the resiliency of what we understand to be true, which we understand thematically as a firm, and we're doubling down on that, around how people engage in content. It is a part, it is a royalty on the human experience, ultimately, right? And so there is nothing more um, non-correlated than that. You know, kind of think of it in the same bucket as people think of like core, necessary, non-discretionary needs, like, you know, 
healthcare, right? Like people have to get up and go to the doctor or get prescriptions. In the same way in the music space, you know, people are listening to and engaging in music and content as a way of um, how they express themselves daily. Um, and so that as a consequence has led to, and seeing that data connected to that resiliency of the human experience has led it to be something that people can think about investing in. But it's a highly fragmented cottage industry. You have to build real scalable resources around it to think about how to do that efficiently. Um, so, you know, it is for firms that have, you know, bespoke solution sets to address the marketplace in the way that it, it, it shows up. It's interesting because you had mentioned earlier, on one hand, non-correlated asset class, but you also started talking about the impact of higher interest rates on investors. Where does the rubber hit the road when it comes to this environment and, and what you're doing? Yeah, I mean, I think, listen, you know, you've seen obviously the spreads in various markets, um, you know, kind of go through a variety of iterations post pandemic, but certainly through the rate hikes over the last 18 months. I, will, I can tell you that from a financing perspective in the market with respect to music, because of the resiliency of the asset class, spreads have stayed tight, you know, and they continue to stay tight. That shows you that, you know, the, the despite the move in rates, it allows for you to continuously efficiently finance this, and it's because of the resiliency of the asset class. So, you know, it does reprice how people think about, you know, what the entry point is from a value perspective or from, you know, a first asset perspective for something that we look to buy. But it doesn't mean that, you know, it doesn't mean that it has created a lack of transaction opportunities, at least not for us as a firm. It's interesting. We started this conversation on kind of the rationale for why people do sell royalties. Uh, they do sell music rights to their own catalogs. Uh, tell us the story. <laughs> what, give, bring us behind one of the deals that you've done in the last couple of years. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, listen, there are many artists who are thinking about the next phase of their career. So you obviously see the Rod Stewart's we purchased from the Christine McVie estate. Um, so, you know, the key member of, or one of the key members of Fleetwood Mac. So there's lots of things that happen around estate planning, around legacy building and around passing on that legacy to heirs. And it's so much easier to give people cash than it is to give them these pile of convoluted rights. So that's one reason. But then you also see contemporary artists like we purchased Nelly's catalog, as you guys know, um, who are looking to create liquidity for themselves so they can start to think about the next phase of their career, create liquidity to create agency. Mm. You know, I think a lot of times people think that, you know, people just want money. But I think just like anything else, it's an asset in their portfolio. Portfolio. They're highly correlated to music and music only because that's the only thing that they do. In the same way that I used to be highly correlated to Morgan Stanley, they were my paycheck and the equity stock that I got. So I would look to create liquidity around that stock. So I wasn't overly correlated to one to one aspect of, of the assets that I own. So there's a variety of different reasons why people look to engage in selling. And then, you know, what we have built is really an ecosystem where people then want to start thinking about what they want to do beyond that. And we're fortunate enough to have, you know, built an ecosystem that allows us to really engage with the artist community around what to do next, um, which has been really exciting. So we have some exciting things on that front coming this year. OK, well, maybe maybe this will be in that realm. I have no idea what you're thinking about. But one thing that I'm thinking about when you're talking about this is in the era of AI and artificial intelligence, is there a way that artists are willing to part with? their likeness in the sense from an AI perspective, and they're willing to sell those rights. Are you thinking about that at all? You know, I'm not sure about AI rights, but obviously we do partner with artists on name, image, and likeness all the time. And, uh, and then that is really around how we think about helping them to continue to achieve the goals that they want to, they want to achieve with respect to their artistry, to their catalog. And that's um, aligned with what it is that we need um, as well, because we're looking at the catalogs continuing to perform and to do well in the ecosystem. Um, so I'm not sure necessarily about AI specific rights on people selling those. I think AI is going to be really interesting to watch, right? It's, you know, it's not new as, as, as has been described. Artificial intelligence has been around. It is a soup du jour, but it is mm -hmm. going to massively change how we all kind of manipulate and engage with data. But it has to be done in a way that's safe and protective and respects existing laws with respect to copyright and copyright engagement. So do you think it'll be really interesting? I think as it relates to media and entertainment, people always play with new technologies in our space first. Think NFTs to ringtones to you know, all of those things. But what I do think will emerge is the opportunity to do things smarter, more efficient, while also dovetailing that with creating 
um, and protecting the agency of the creator economy as well, because those two things can't live alone. Human beings want to engage with content and music and stories that are created from their, the human experience, not from a generated experience. And so I do strongly believe that AI will be a tool for efficiency, but not a tool for replacement around the creative system. Okay, that's some reassuring news to hear as somebody who does not want to be replaced by AI. Sharice, we love it when you join us. Thanks as always for, for taking the time. Sharice joining us from New Jersey uh, this afternoon. Sharice clark Soros, founder and CEO of Harborview Equity Partners, former managing director at Morgan Stanley, among many other titles.